Well, welcome to the Apologia Center podcast. Uh, my name is Arthur uh, Asadurian, for those who might not be aware. And I have a very special guest, and I'm very happy that he jumped into a chat. Um, a couple of days ago, and then we discussed we discussed this and decided to do it, and, and it's happening. We've had some technical difficulties and stuff uh, that is just a part of life, but I think I think it'll work. I think we're there. So I want to welcome my my good friend uh, Dr. Keith Bueller, and um, thanks for being here, man. Thanks thanks for doing this, dude. It's my pleasure. I'm really glad to be on. I, I guess you could say I slid into your DMs a little bit there on when you're doing a live stream. <laughs> That is uh, that that I, I guess maybe goes to show that uh, you you work with a bunch of young people for you even to be using that that terminology. I'm feeling the beard, by the way. That's right. Oh, thank you. Yeah, my <laughs> my wife wants me to to trim it for uh, for summer here, but this is a couple hard years of work. <laughs> it, it's always tough, right? Uh, my my son recently um, had uh, like we grew his hair his hair out, and he loved it. And my wife was like, it's summer, cut it. And uh, he just like, he plays soccer. He looks like a soccer player with like, long hair. And uh, yes. we, cu- we cut it and uh, and everybody on the team was complaining. And they're like, what did you do to his hair? Is it, talk to his mom. And so I told him, we'll, we'll start growing it out in September. So there uh, you yeah, go. It's all, especially with facial hair, man. You like, you get connected to it so much. You do. I mean, I, I read in some article that was like, it was on the internet, so it's probably reliable. Um, it said, uh, "It said that a beard is like a extrasensory perception organ, or like your hair is, you know. So like the longer your hair and your beard, and that I think it checks out when you look at uh, Walt Whitman, Tolstoy, you know, some of these like. So if you're gonna be a great author, you gotta go with a great beard. Oh man, tell me about it. Um, I think I think it was Spurgeon that said something like a beard is the most godly and biblical thing. So there you go. You got Spurgeon <laughs> to, to back that up as well." <laughs> Uh, so, so good, yeah. That's a good quote. I love that quote. Um, and then I was watching some weird preacher the other day uh, on TikTok talking about how beards are like very anti-apostolic and anti like biblical and stuff, which was hilarious to me, considering that Jesus most likely had a beard. You know, there's prophetic stuff about his beard yep. being plucked out, and so yeah, it's just Westernism being, I think, propagated, considering all of church history. <laughs> Almost all the That's religious right. leaders had beards. I know. It's like, it, you know, it, it's, it's, it helps you tell the difference between boys and girls. You know, I teach my toddlers, like, you can tell a boy and a girl from who has a beard. That's why Uncle Kevin is a lady, you know. Um, <laughs> that's my brother. <laughs> now, he, he has since grown a beard, so I have to cut that joke out. Oh, but, yeah, that's it. Um, you know, it's, uh, that, that, that's, like, really <laughs> controversial nowadays to even say that there's that, a That's true. Here. That's true. That's true. As, as of five minutes ago, that wasn't a controversial joke, but it's very current now. Um, he doesn't identify as a lady. I'm identifying him for correct, him. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if one can do that, but whatever. Uh, I want to read like right. a, a little bit of your your educational kind of your CV, your educational career, kind of what you went through. Usually, when I have guests uh, jump on this, we speak about what that was like, just practically throughout their um their life and their family children um and so you got a ba in humanities with an emphasis on history from biola university uh you got an ma in applied orthodox theology we'll talk about that a little bit and that's from the university university of bellamand that's how americans say it i'm sure that's not how uh the lebanese say it uh, bellamand yeah yeah that's right. uh, and then you have a phd in philosophy from uh university of kentucky and you did that. All that stuff was done between 2004 and 2017. That's a pretty long time. That's so I'm, right. I'm assuming you were single uh, when you started, you know, Biola, and then you ended up getting married and having kids and all of that change. What was that like, man? What was, tell me about that. Yeah. So I think the biggest gap in there was 2004 to 2010. Um, <clears throat> you could say I was wandering one of my roommates said you know you've been wandering for a few years haven't you and i was like no dude i'm on a self-discovery journey like i'm not wandering but anyhow from the outside it clearly looked that way professionally i I didn't have a clear ambition a clear goal i took me a couple years to get into education after um after i graduated and once i got into education and became you know a teacher and i was really loving that i was like okay i think this 
kind of locks graduate school plans in place. I, I do want to get a PhD someday. The roundabout, uh, the, the MA in Applied Orthodox Theology was uh, simply because I was becoming Orthodox at that point. I was kind of getting catechized, and I wanted to study, and I wanted to, uh, to learn more about the history of the faith. <clears throat> and so I did that. That took two or three years of mostly remote work. We did like a week on, on campus residency every year. And once I finished that, that's by the end of that, my wife and I were married. And uh, I, my, I told her, like, I'm ready to travel the country once we're married. But before that, like, we, our families are here. I'm not going to apply all over. You know, we applied to Toronto, Texas, Kentucky, uh, and then Claremont, California. So the long story short is, you know, graduated, worked odd jobs for several years, got into education, became Orthodox, and then got into that Ph.D. program at about age 30. Okay. So you're a part of the Eastern Orthodox Church uh, that uh, yeah. we stated, and and we're still friends, right? I, That's I, right. I, I pick your brain quite a bit, man. I, I'm always like texting you and telling you to send me resources and stuff. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's right. And uh, and, um, and we we've been collabing on this this school that you know our mutual friends started. We've been collabing on that for a long time, and yes. always enjoy our conversations. Yeah, and and you're a great help to us. So uh, th that's what you do. So you've you've kind of gone around and you've uh, settled as a uh, as a headmaster essentially. Um, yeah, tell I, us a little bit about, about even, that project. Even during grad school, I was working for classical Christian high schools. Like I was, I was trying to make time because that's where I started teaching. And that's where I wanted to end up teaching. Even the PhD, there was a few. There was a few years there in graduate school. PhD in philosophy, you know, most of your listeners probably know, basically qualifies you to be a professor. You know, some people write, some people teach. Um, there's there's a there's a large percentage of PhDs today who, um, if they even if they do finish, they end up in what we call alt ac alternative academic positions. So maybe you're you know. Maybe you're an admission counselor, or maybe you're a, uh, you know, some kind of a, a, a provost, or not. That's a pretty high up position, but maybe you're some kind of an assistant in the administration of a university rather than a straight philosopher, mm. teacher, writer, researcher. So I, I, I wasn't super committed to becoming an academic, getting that, you know, um, full time teaching job at University of wherever. Um, I really wanted to be in classical Christian education. That's where my that's where my passion is. That's kind of what changed my life as a young adult. So when I got out, uh, my first job was teaching here in California and did that for four years and learned a lot from my boss. I told my boss the day she hired me, I said, can I follow you around and learn what you do? Because I want to I want to start my own school someday or I want to run a, a, an existing school someday. And she said, yeah. And um, she's a very good leader, hard to imitate, you know, but I did learn a lot from <clears throat> And, and I learned a lot, you know, in teaching and got to apply some of that philosophical training that I got in the classroom. I taught a dual credit, you know, like college and high school credit, dual credit philosophy class. So I kind of got to like be their first intro philosophy professor. And then this opportunity came up with this church um, <clears throat> out in Riverside that's been wanting to start their own school. And I said, look, if I do this for you, it's going to be a classical Christian school. We're going to do Latin and Greek. We're going to do philosophy and rhetoric. We're going to go the whole distance. And they said, great, that works for us. We love the vision. We love the energy. And they brought me on board. Um, they already had like an education committee, right? So I sort of just like inserted myself into this community um, and started this thing. So we went from – it's now – uh, so our last day was yesterday, <laughs> our first year. We we went from this thing that was a was a twinkle in the eye in November 2019. <clears throat> we did about about 18 months of prep. We launched September 2021, and we just finished our first year. Wow, amazing! Yeah. Okay. So here's here's the thing that that some people might not be aware of the classical education, right? Um, mm -hmm. some people might hear that word and, and think, uh, or that term and, and think, oh, he just means like old education or something like that. Like it's classic. Yeah. Um, yeah. and w I mean, what, what's even the difference there? I mean, classical education as opposed to what, uh, right. And so give us a little bit about classical education, what the philosophy behind the, uh, behind it is, what the model is. When did you, you said that changed your life when you were, um, you, when you were in your teens, like, where was that? What was that? Um, and, um, yeah, so kind of give a breakdown of classical education and why 
you prefer it over the other kinds of education. Oh, you're muted. I lost your audio there. You've muted yourself, so. Might be in like the, the green room background. You've muted yourself for the link I sent you. I can't hear you. Okay, let me do this. Um, okay, we'll, we'll have Keith on right now, okay? So he's going to call back. We'll have him right on. So for those of you guys who are watching, um, he's going to define what classical education looks like. And if you've never heard the term, I highly suggest you look it up. Uh, tell me, uh, you know, leave in the comment section. I mean, if you have questions about it, resources, um, type away. Uh, I'll try to get you guys links and uh, resources for that. So, let's see. So by the way, guys, we're talking with Keith Bueller. He just had some audio problems. He's going he's gonna to call back. We're talking classical education, character development, and, and what that looks like. So stick around as he's going he's gonna to call back right now. Um, and this is the stuff. This is live, guys. This is when you do live stuff. Oh, there we are. Okay. We're back. Okay, so I don't know what happened. It was just muted. I couldn't hear you. Whatever, technology. Yeah, just uh, <laughs> my my audio cut out on my end. So I was like, I can answer the last question, but I can't hear it at the next one. Okay, so um, the, the question, uh, what, what did you hear? Tell me. Well, I heard you say, yeah, the, the what is the classical education? You know, what's the context for that? Is that just old education or what? Yeah, so is it old education and then is it classical education as opposed to what kind of education? I mean, what other models of education? There's a lot of people don't that do not know or are not aware that there are multiple different philosophies of how to educate young people. That's right. Or just people in general, not just young people. <laughs> That's right. No, it depends on your your view of humanity, right? So, uh -huh. um what is a good human? What is a good young human <laughs> depends on your view of what's a good human. Hmm. Um so the, the three kind of a really helpful heuristic, you know, simplification, but three models of education. Um, one of them we sort of think of as education unqualified, and that's modern. We can call it modern education. And that would be like your representative would be like a, um, uh, a John Dewey. OK. Um, and the idea there, um, this is probably most public schools, you know, maybe uh, a lot of charter schools, most private schools would fall into this middle kind of category. And the goal is um, to prepare young people for society. So it assumes society is a certain way, the job market's a certain way, and it's basically just getting them up to kind of the bare minimum of competency, reading, writing, to be able to get a job and function in society the way it exists. Um, and uh, so the, you could say the anthropology or the assumption about humanity is that people, you know, want to, we're social animals, we want to fit in, we want to have a normal life, and normal is pretty much kind of what you see, what you mm. see out here. There's, no, there's not really a heavenly transcendent vision of, you know, radical sanctification or anything like that. So the and the second model would be like progressive education, which is a okay, lot of so, what you so see. So hang on before you uh, – okay. So you yeah. said most uh, schools, public schools, and then you also made, made a comment about private schools would fall into this category. Yeah. So uh, most the, private schools are public school, you know, same public school anthropology and philosophy. Uh -huh. It's just a different demographic. Maybe you have more wealthy people. Maybe you have more athletic people. Maybe you have more – um, in a certain private school, maybe you have uh, more people who are focused on, you know, their sport or their chess or their like Olympic training, you know, like they have their little niches. But essentially the brand, the philosophy of education is the same. OK, so again, that, that, just to make sure that just because something is private as opposed to public doesn't necessarily mean 
that it's a different philosophy of education. That's that's the point. That's right. I mean, you, you, if you go ask the administrator and you go ask the teachers, you know, what are we doing here? Um, they're going to talk about preparing, you know, in their own words, they're going to talk about preparing these students for the world as it exists. And basically, by preparing them for the world, they mean jobs, money. Uh, I that heard kind that. I heard that all throughout. Like, look, I went to school in the United States. I started school uh, half of fifth grade, and all the way through. And I just all of that time, I had teachers saying, uh, "You're learning this so that you would go into the real world." Um, which yeah. now, when I think about it, I kind of go, what, "What was I not in the real world?" <laughs> I was like, yeah. right? like "What do you mean? Like I'm gonna go into yeah. the real world?" Like, right? Again, at the time, obviously, I didn't conceptualize. I just, I guess, I understood that as like adulthood or something like that. But I was in the yeah. real world in that process. Uh, but the the, the per, I guess the idea there, the philosophy was to prepare me for society, to to be an independent member of society somehow. That's right, and it's a pretty minimal definition. It's like, can you read billboards, and can you, uh, you know, can you drool onto your keyboard while you're <laughs> working a desk job? Like that's that's co considered like success or normal. Hmm. Um, and then uh, and then progressive education is. Um, is this idea that, and you could say John Dewey was a progressive, but not in this sense. Um, he thought, you know, schools need to be like factories that churn out little people, pet, you know, cogs in the machine. Mm -hmm. Progressive education says we need to cha change young people into change agents that will bring us into a kind of a utopian future. So uh -huh. the way the world is is not good enough. It's too racist. It's too sexist. It's too une une unequal in terms of economic status. It's too... Um, it's too split into haves and have nots. However, you kind of break down that sort of like those Marxist or neo Marxist categories. So the progressive wants to prepare young people to be change agents to make the world a different place in the future. So it's not even in, in their view, in, in the, in, in, to be fair, in their view, to make the world a better place. Right. Like that's, that's right. That's the ideology. Yeah. It's a, it's kind of a, you know, a, a utopia that may be unattainable, but it's worth fighting for and it's worth, uh, you know, destroying some of the current structures to get there. That we're going to have to build the future out of the ashes of the present system, and that kind of an idea. So, progressive education you're going to find mostly in universities, but it's trickling down now, as many of these educational fads do, from the Ivy Leagues to other universities, from other universities to the mm. teacher training colleges and credentialing programs into high school. So, you've got LGBT preschool teachers and first grade teachers who view it as their mission to teach these kids uh, sexual perversity, you know, forgive me. And, and that's their job because they want, they think the world should be more like that by the time the kids 18, 20, huh. 30. Um, so that's, that's more progressive education. And I want to prepare you for the way society is because it's terrible. I want to make you a fire that's going to burn the world down and hopefully make it better. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I suppose, I suppose th this is where the conflict uh, that we see in our, uh, in the last like three, four years, it's that you've had a lot of parents and we saw this throughout the United States, school board meetings, parents showing up and saying, dude, I'm, I'm 35, I'm 40. When I went to school, they taught me reading, writing, math. What are you guys teaching my kids? And then there's also the other idea is it's none of your business as a teacher to teach that stuff to my yeah. kids because I am the responsible party over my kids, not you. And that's a difference in ideology too because who's really in charge of this child? Is it their teacher right. or is it the parent, right? So we got a clash of worldviews really taking place right in front of our eyes. Yeah. Yeah, and the, I mean, the irony there is that if, if a parent did agree with that progressive ideology and they wanted a teacher and a school that agreed with that ideology and was going to teach them, that looks a lot like education is just the transmission of my, my beliefs down to my children. That's, huh. that's kind of more the, class, the classical model. We we view so the third the third um, the third picture here is that um, class is that education doesn't prepare kids for the way things are or the way they should be in a, some sort of like you know progressive you know, utopian sense. For, uh, classical education teaches kids the way the world has been, huh. and it gives them a, a vision and ideal on the basis of the past. So when the ideal is um, you know the republic. The, the, the just political system of Plato where everyone has a place and where justice reigns and the good, everyone, everyone is uh, able to see the good, the transcendent good. 
or the the idea the ideal is from christianity the kingdom of god christendom god's kingdom coming to earth where where uh, only holy and wise and just people are in charge and all of us benefit from being their sheep from following their you know the shepherd Mm. so we there is a there is an alternative ideal there it's not a utopian ideal of that we can hardly picture we kind of don't even really know what it would look like for to have class equality for example what would it mean for men and women to be equal in society it's never occurred anywhere in the history of the world so we have no idea what that would even mean and if you ask people that they they kind of just talk about how bad things are now they don't really give you an answer so a classical education says we actually are inheritors of a great tradition in the west the west is is uh is not perfect but it's the best we have and um, we want to transmit the culture that we've received. We want to inherit it ourselves. We want to transmit it to our children. And yes, they will improve society, and they may cl- more closely approximate that ideal in their own generation than we've ever seen before. But we also don't have – we don't harbor utopian hopes. We know that uh-huh. humanity is pretty broken. Um, and that's all, that's all true for even like a Platonist. I'm not talking about Christianity yet. Uh, a Platonist or an Aristotelian, you know, Aristotle said society should be hard to change but possible. Hmm. It shouldn't be too easy to change because then it's too soft and you actually don't have connections between those generations. The parent don't relate to the kids. The kids don't relate to the grandkids. You know, the parents don't relate to, the, to their parents anymore. Um, but it should be possible to change but not easy to change. And so, yes, when there's things that are wrong in society, we have to think very carefully – and very patiently about long-term solutions, not rush to to the revolution. What would actually help this? And then we have to make slow changes. Um, so that that is part of the classical ideal is we will produce change agents, but we'll also produce a lot of people for whom life is pretty good, and they are able to pursue an ideal of life that's more than just work, and they're able to have kids and raise their kids to also live that life. Hmm. So it's a much more, you could say, uh, stable and traditional vision of what the good life is okay um so I, I, one of the things that comes to the surface here is this difference between creating this utopian kind of sense and then this idea that we're, we're probably not going to have that i mean with, with christianity uh that just doesn't exist because people are sinners and and sin is always going to be in the issue so that's like if we're going to talk about classical education in the christian sense but you said it's not just necessarily a christian sense because it's it's rooted in classical Greek philosophy as well. And then Christians, you could say Christianized this. And then that's just been the Western, uh, you know, story. Here's uh, that's right. usually when it comes to classical education, I hear folks, and I've said this before, is, th- is that um, our kind of goal is to teach people to love that, uh, to love that which is good, beautiful, and true. That's right. Um, and this assumes a number of things. No, number one, it assumes that truth exists and it can be known. Yeah. Right? Uh, that beauty is objective, right? Yep. And That's that a big one. Moral, uh, moral absolutes exist and there's like standards, ethical behavior and stuff like that. Where That's right. Uh, one of the things I'm seeing in the modern university, American university, and just the modern culture is that th- these things are argued, like beauty is in the eye of the beholder. That's out the window. Truth yep. doesn't exist because relativism reigns, right? Or everybody right. has their own truth or something like that. And then, and then moral, uh, ethical kind of standards don't really exist. And that maybe comes from truth not existing. And so therefore, that doesn't exist. Um and it's so fundamentally against each other. These these ideas, like there's there's really no way we can even reconcile these things, or is there? I don't know. Like you tell me. <laughs> no, I I think that um, they're they're fundamentally they're logically contradictory, right? Truth either exists or doesn't. And if you say, well, what do you mean by truth? It's like uh, the 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 common sense definition of truth that you're using when you say you, when there is no truth, right? We, we agree on the definition of truth is correspondence to reality. Roughly. Um, it's the matching of your beliefs to the way things are. Mm -hmm. Aristotle says, um, to say of what is that it is and to say of what is not that it is not, that's truth. Um, that's pretty good. Uh, you know, beauty is actually not that hard to, to understand. Everybody has, if you, if you talk about, um, you know, if you're talking about math, there's big, simple equations, 2 plus 2, 3 times 3. 
um, even if you know some basics, 15 plus 15. Um, these things are not hard. There's there's big, easy, aesthetic questions. You know, is a rose beautiful? Is a sunset beautiful? Um, is uh, what whoever's the top model right now in the world? You know, um, are these people beautiful? The answer is yeah. It's so hard to miss it. Um, what where people kind of think that they're relativists about beauty when they're not actually is they think well there's these edge cases where it's hard to define beauty uh is plato more beautiful uh, is is a uh, is mozart more beautiful than beethoven that's like oh i don't i mean you probably yeah. need a phd in music to even know the answer to that question but and and to convince somebody might be even harder so but that's not that's not where you start you don't start with the um you know what is uh the square root of 17 that's not how you start math. The fact that it's hard for you doesn't mean that there's no right answer. Correct. The fact that I'm an ignoramus about you know some subject doesn't mean that there's not an expert out there. There's beauty experts. They're called cinematographers. They're called photographers. They're called painters. They're called yeah. uh, interior designers. You know, my mother-in-law is like, I'm not an artist, and yet she can whip together a house to the point where you it would get drive up the value 100 grand. Right? So <laughs> your her beauty standard is valuable. It's objective and it's real. So. Um, or people say, I'm not an artist, and then they cook you like the most beautiful meal where the aesthetics of it. So art isn't just what you do with a paintbrush. <clears throat> yeah. um, and you can you can track this with people's salaries. Some cinematographers make more money because their sense of beauty is, you know, if, if beauty is what's needed for a film, then they're the person you hire. Um, so I forget where I was going with that, but truth, beauty, goodness, being objective is a huge claim. I think it's much easier to defend than... Um, then some people give it credit for because they've simply never reflected on it. They've, they've inherited their relativism pretty much unreflectively. Mm -hmm. It's just assumed that everyone has their own truth and that you're kind of a naughty person if you say, hey, yeah, that's objectively wrong. I'm not being rude, right? Like I'm just pointing to facts. Um, and so, you know, when you're, when you're acclimated socially to this idea that we don't judge each other, we don't judge each other's opinions, we don't judge each other's taste, that makes you feel like a nice, polite person, but it's not like you reflectively endorsed an intellectual position of relativism. Yeah. Um, well, even, so even that, that's not even true they... in the commonsensical uh, way, right? It's like, oh, we don't judge yeah. anyone, but everybody judges Hitler, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, we don't like you should... these genocide maniacs. We all judge them. I mean, we we all think that's they right. were wrong. We all think they were evil. As a matter of fact, um, if if, if we, you kind of we try to go, oh no, people. they had reasons. Yeah, exactly. Um, I was in a yeah. conversation. I got in a conversation one time at a restaurant. Um, I was talking to an atheist friend uh, and these two ladies were sitting and they overheard us and they said, hey, we're interested in this conversation and stuff like that. So I engaged them and I found out that one was a, a Jewish individual. The other one was Persian, Iranian, but a Buddhist. The The Jewish okay. individual uh, lady was um, more like agnostic and stuff like that. And so I asked them a number of questions about you know, truth and morality and stuff. And, and the Iranian lady, who's the essentially like new age Buddhist lady was saying, Oh, it's all relative and stuff like that. And truth doesn't exist in morality. And, and, and then, so, you know, I was a bit sly here because I knew my audience. So I said, um, if it's all relative, can you tell me what, if Hitler, whatever Hitler did was, uh, was wrong, obviously knowing there's a Jewish friend uh, of her sitting there. And then the, the, Jew, the Jewish lady sitting there, said uh, oh because the conversation about hell came up and she said i can never believe in hell she said i've tried christianity i can never believe in hell it's too cruel and stuff and then i said well would you think it would it'd be fair if hitler right or was in heaven never repented or something like that and then the jewish friend said you better think very carefully about how you're gonna answer this question <laughs> and you know this whole time we're talking about like not non-judgmentalism and that's the area she's going into but once these people get yeah. mentioned these people that we can very objectively say are evil then there's a clash yeah. with our ideas. It's like, oh, I don't make sense of this. Right. I mean, I think that um, that's what I mean by unreflective is like that's a that's a pretty good counterexample. Like uh, we could come up with others. Like, do you think bank robbery is OK? Yeah. Is, you know, is it ever OK? Uh, do you think someone walking into your house and taking your stuff? You know, do you think that, you know, uh, your bot your bodily integrity being put on the line? Are these things potentially wrong? And it's like, well, yeah, obviously. And so what happens if you reflect? I mean, the, the sort of average relativist, when they reflect, the amount of stuff that they consider to be relative shrinks. So when they say everything's truth and morality is relative, what they end up meaning is sexual behaviors are uh -huh. relative. And you can't judge people for their sexual sins or sexual perversities, right? 
And so it's like, well, yeah, there's perverse, you know, like stalk. People believe stalking is wrong. Yeah. You know, if I'm, if I'm stalking you, and yet if I'm uh, engaging in aberrant sexual behaviors, that's not wrong. That's all they mean by relativism. And I would just say, oh, I go, I go the whole distance. There's certain. I look very, you know, I try to be impartial and unbiased. I don't think I'm a moral. I don't think I'm a, uh, a moral genius that already knows all moral facts in advance. I think I have to learn what's right and wrong. Mm. I have to be formed and trained in my in my thoughts and my sentiments to love what's good and true and beautiful. So I go to moral sages and teachers, saints, Christ himself, um, <clears throat> even non-Christian sages and, and so on. And I say, what is right and wrong? What is good and bad? And they have taught me that there's a very small and clear lane for what sexual behaviors are healthy, life-giving, and allowed. And I, that's what I thats what I take from them, right? So my yeah. phone's getting warm, it says. And so I don't make up the rules. I don't have off. to judge people who are breaking the rules. Can you still hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, just, just letting folks know, if his phone kind of goes nuts and it's like way too hot and it shuts down, we'll end this and I'll have Keith on uh, another time and we'll finish this conversation. Um. So, yeah, so sure. okay. So, the 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 wisdom there of going to these, you know, sages and 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 characters who've, uh, you know, who've had a good amount of influence on our culture and stuff like that. Now, you're a philosopher. You have a PhD in philosophy, right? How does that, like, that has to be different when you're talking to an eight year old. How many kids do you have, by the way? So people know. I got four kids. You have four children. Yeah, okay. nine. Nine, seven, uh, and then four and a one-year-old. Yeah, so you're not going to sit with your nine-year-old, let's just say, or your seven-year-old and be like, okay, Plato says, right? Or, or are you? I'm not, <laughs> right? I'm not sure. Uh, you might be. I am teaching to... him Plato a little bit, yeah. Okay. Um, so, okay. Um, so cl when classical education comes into this context of, of educating the young, I mean, what are you really introducing them to? that is going to develop critical thinking rather than just plain old indoctrination or whether even yes, maybe yes. indoctrination is so, not a bad thing. I mean, would, would we really consider well, something it, wrong it if it's depends true? On the doctrine. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think everybody to, depending on how you define it, everybody indoctrinates their kids. It's, it's cruel not to, because you're saying I'm not going to give them truth and send uh -huh. them out into the world with it. I'm going to, you know, like, leave their brains empty that that's not actually loving but um i think that like again drawing from plato and aristotle a little bit here they they talk about um like the age of reason concept that at some point reason comes to you maybe it's when you're 12 maybe it's when you're eight um you know kids can start to follow arguments at a pretty young age the abstract logical connections between things they can make associations like immediately yes but actual rational connections between premises and conclusions that comes a little bit later and you, it's not perfected and you know, until 18, 25 end of your life. Um, it's, it's a continually developing capacity, but before that age of reason, let's say eight or 12. Okay. Um, you are more focused on forming their loves. Do they love what's beautiful and harmonious? You're more focused on what music you let them listen to, what movies you let them watch, if any, what video games you let them play, if any, you're more focused on their taste because bad taste, once it's formed, bad taste is easy, right? I, I, you know, I'm, I'm sitting at the present moment in a McDonald's, literally, unironic. It's easy to like McDonald's. It's not necessarily healthy to have it all the time. Yeah. It's easy to like, um, you know, pop music. It's not necessarily healthy for your soul to listen to it all the time. Correct. I enjoy pop music. Um, but I try to keep it in moderation. It's easy to like video games. They're designed to be addictive and to be fun and to give you this certain kind of leveling up sense of progress. And that feels good, when, especially when life is kind of sucky. Um, but they need to be taken in moderation. So with, with, I would say as a classical educator and a parent, I'm, I'm, I'm very careful about what books I put in front of my son's nose, what we read to them at night. I'm very careful about what they watch. And I'm very careful about the music that I let them develop an attachment to because those things are going to have a huge impact on what they choose when they come to the age of reason, what they choose to spend their time on. You know, I was reflecting on something yesterday. Uh, there's a number of people uh, I've seen in the church context who uh, I'll tell you this because I have a very big sensitivity towards music. OK, so when when I became a believer at 18 years old, I was like a like a maniac Eminem fan. 
Like I would literally go okay. to sleep with this guy in my ears. And, and I realized very early on in my Christianity that I was kind of angry and antsy against authority and stuff. And I was like, where's this coming from? And this could have just yeah. been revelation from God, like saying, hey, man, it's the stuff you're listening to. So I, I threw away all of my, uh, my M&M CDs. And, and then it would bother me when I would see in youth group, just in church, younger people listening to music that was just not good for them. And they were promoting things like so, sexual promiscuity. Like here I am as an 18, 19, 20, 21 year old single guy trying to keep my head pure, my thoughts pure. And it's like, oh, I, I walk into uh, someone's car or whatever. And they're listening to a song that's all about like getting with girls or something like that. It's like, okay, I don't, I don't need to think about that. Right. Here's what I realized yesterday. Well, not realized, but I, I guess noticed and, uh, um, and just reflected on the individuals that never heeded that, that I still know, essentially all, all have come to a place in their life uh, are either like agnostic, extremely lukewarm in their Christianity, progressive, pro-LGBTQ uh, kind of stuff. And I'm kind of like, okay, maybe there's a correlation there, right? That, that mm -hmm. the, the music they listen to, the stuff that this was promoting – um, yes. and that it, that stuff won out over their biblical convictions and they're like, Oh, I'm still a Christian, but like, Oh, you, you can't, you're being nasty to these people because you've created an emotional attachment to these ideas because you've listened to this music for the past 15 years and it's influenced. Yeah. Right. And yeah, I, 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 I used to be... my, home, my home with my kids, right? Like, what are they watching? What are they not watching? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think I used to think that there was something like immoral, right, about listening to non-Christian music. We used to call it, you know, that there's something immoral about watching movies that had like the F word in it or something like that. And I and I no longer think that. I, I agree with I agree with you that there does seem to be some negative consequences to consuming this stuff. It's not necessarily like oh I was right that that was immoral. It's more about like health and balance and moderation. Is there something immoral about having a McDonald's burger? No. It, is it going to – are you going to pay the price over the long term if you never eat fruits and veggies, you're right? Yeah. yeah, you're going to pay the price. So I think of M&M as something more like uh, – I mean it's not like a McDonald's burger. It's it's a – he's he's a great artist. Oh, right? yeah. He's a, look. probably the greatest greatest rapper. The music's pretty good. Um, if you listen to it once in a while, you can sort of say, oh, that was nice. And I'm going to go back to my – uh, peaceful music, my high elevated music. You know, don't, you don't have to love classical education. There's plenty of beautiful or classical music, right? Um, you, you, there's plenty of beautiful music out there that's not so easy to love and yet so detrimental in the long run. So, yeah. you know, maybe it's just a moderation thing. And those people who said it's not wrong, therefore I'm going to watch R-rated movies all the time, um, actually are paying the price and, and aren't reflecting on it's a quantity issue, you know? Yeah, so so the thing is that not, it, it wasn't the, for me the initial state. This was very exp experiential, I guess. Is that it wasn't like an immoral or moral question. It was I realized I was just angry at authority all the time, and I couldn't put my finger on yeah. it. I, I was like, "Where is this coming from?" Because under normal circumstances, I I respect authority. I was brought up in a pretty conservative, like culturally conservative Armenian home where you always respect authority. Like that was never really an issue, and yeah. then all of a sudden it's it's an issue. So it's just. Uh, this thing popped up and I was like, okay, this is probably not very good for me. Um, That's right. Yeah. So it, it, it's, it, I, I guess we can go, take this to the second part of what the title to this video is that has to do with personal development, because the question is not whether something's immoral or moral or in that gray area. It's do I have the character development and the personal development where I can maybe engage in that thing without getting caught up in that thing? Right. And yeah. I mean, you've, you've used the word moderation quite a bit here. And what that looks like, yeah. what that looks like with children specifically, like you're raising up yeah. people to, f so they can have solid characters. And, and I yeah. always say, look, I don't necessarily have a guarantee. And maybe there's a theological difference between me and you here, but um, I don't necessarily have a guarantee but my, that my children will actually follow Jesus um, right. and, and whether they're, they will be Christians or not. But at the very least, I can, I can, to the best of my abilities, try to develop character in them where they're mature yeah. individuals, even if they're That's not right. Christians. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is kind of 
two part two part response but like yeah i think parenting is setting them up for their own choices right they're going to be autonomous individuals whether you like it or not teenagers often rebel because you're not giving them enough autonomy mm. and it's like sort of terrifying to think about giving them more autonomy because they're already screwing up a little bit of autonomy that they have but the, but if if your goal is to launch you know um one of my mentors even said it's better if parents think of themselves as nannies and stewards because they think they make huh. more rational decisions if this was somebody else's kid and your only goal was to to parent them as best, best as you could and then give them away when you're done you would make more rational decisions. You wouldn't let partiality and favoritism and bias get in the way so much, which is actually bad for your kids, right? Where you spoil them, that kind of thing. Um, so if my goal is to make them autonomous as soon as possible, I'm not rushing them out the door, but you know, at some point I'm going to tell my kids, like, daddy's not going to tell you what to do anymore. I will give you any advice, but you have to ask. Hmm. And at some point I may not give them advice. I may say, um, that's a hard one. Like, let me know what you decide and let me know how it works out. You know, there at some point, maybe, maybe in their you know early twenties, there'll be like, I'll give you as much, I'll listen as you're processing and I'll give you a little bit of advice, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to interfere because it's your life now. <clears throat> so if that's your goal, if that's your understanding of parenting, then you front load. Everything you can do is to give them the tools and the character to, to actually handle that freedom. Well, and I think that's how God treats us. I think that's how good teachers treat us. And I think that's how good parents treat their kids. And it's not, by the way, how my parents raised me. I'm telling you stuff that I've had to learn, you know, because of having kids and being terrified of like, I, I don't want to just do things the way that I had them done to me because huh. I don't think it was very intentional. Yeah, that's good. Um, and, so, so in what, I, what, what kind think, of literature yeah. for young people? I guess trying to connect this with the whole classical education. What kind of literature? Yeah. Um, I mean, literature matters, right? Like my son is hooked on yeah. reading right now, and I'm so happy that yeah. he's he's like this. Like he has a Thank night God. light he has on uh, at like nine p.m., and his siblings are sleeping, and the guy's got books. He's 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 reading. Um, and so, what kind of literature do we put into the hands of our children? Um, this is so that that, is where, that like, gets word, developed. Yeah, I mean the word classics, right? Is is helpful? Like classics are those best of the best of the best. You know, they take take the top ten percent of the top ten percent of the top ten percent, and throw like why give them anything less if they're you know if they're only going to read so many books before they leave your house? Why give them the kind of the the modern modern schlock? So we huh. we there's um. That we, we take recommendations from friends. Oh, you have to read Green Ember. You know, Green Ember by S.D. Smith, very influenced by Tolkien and Lewis. Um, it's fantasy in which the main characters are virtuous and wise, and the villains are have clear vices and are fools. And so it's it's fun, it's exciting, it's rabbits with swords, you know. And so well, we'll we'll read a modern book. It's not a classic by any means yet, um, but we'll read it with them and we'll talk about it. We'll enjoy it. But if it's not recommended highly by somebody that we trust, then we stick to things that have been recommended by the past, right? Recommended by the what what Chesterton calls the democracy of the dead. You know, uh -huh. if if that if for a thousand years, um, every generation had. You know, think before the printing press, they had to copy it out letter by letter. If a thousand pe years of people copying this book out letter by letter is them saying you need to read this book, that's a strong recommendation. So um, that's more than five stars, you know? Um, so we read things like uh, – right now I'm reading a lot of George McDonald to the kids. Okay, so here's, because... here's the thing. Uh, this is the conversation that came up in, in my stream the other day when you jumped in. You, you said, hey, have you read George oh, yeah. McDonald and stuff like that? And this is not written in uh, – right? Like it's, it's a novel essentially. It's not written in the, in the yeah. way that, you know, philo philosophical literature that philosophers love reading. But it's so rich in its content of philosophical literature, and you're reading this stuff to your kids. That's right. Oh yeah, I mean they're they're loving it. They love Grimm's fairy tales. Um, and those are not usually over their head, but there is some stuff in the fairy tales that's that's pretty deep, and you know it might go over their head. It might be sticking and percolating around in their in their heart. But the the George McDonald stuff. I mean, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna bring up. The part where North Wind is is defending herself, why she's able to cause calamity and still be good. I'm going to bring that up and be like, so what do you make of that? You know, it's like quizzing them. Um, that's another, by the way, that's another 
feature of classical education that people talk about a lot, and I agree with, is, is Socratic dialogue and uh -huh. asking questions, and, you know, almost like interviewing your students. And, and I think there's even research to show that it's a good way of teaching is to quiz people by oral assessment, right? Can you, not just can you write the math equation out, can you explain to me the answer in your own words? That person knows math. If they can just, if they can explain their, their answer. So oftentimes just asking your kid, hey, what happened in that show? Tell me, tell me the plot. And they're like, what's a plot? Okay, well now I can teach you something about, now tell me the plot. Oh, this happened, this happened. Okay, what was the conflict? What's a conflict? Conflict is like, you know, the struggle that they were having to get to their goal. So you're having a conversation with your kid, you're also educating them, and you're teaching them the tools to be able to analyze what they're reading. So I'll, you know, I'll ask them what, you know, what did, what did North, what is North been saying about, isn't it sad that she has to sink a ship? What, what is she, what was her answer? Hmm. And I'll see if they can comprehend it. I, I don't know until they, <laughs> until they open their mouth. Um, I brought my daughter with me to a business meeting this morning, and I kept, I started quizzing her afterwards. So what did you learn, you know? And she got a couple things right. If most of it was over her head, but but it was it was cool. Yeah, yeah, they're they're, they're quick like that, man. Um, kids, uh, I've found, and you know, we're 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 the, we're parents of young kids, and it's uh, I always hear uh, there's a there's a guy I know, uh, Mike Austin, and he's been on the podcast, and Mike said that he wrote a book on uh, on parenting, and he said most people who write books on parenting are young parents. And he said, I, I don't know whether that's like a good thing or a bad thing, right? Um, it's like you talk to people who've grown, you know, ra raised their kids and stuff like that. Um, the thing about classical education that I, I kind of want to go, uh, go back to and classical reading, I, I guess reading the classics, is when it goes over your head, and a lot of these things are deep in, in their ideology, not necessarily maybe their content, yeah. but the ideas, is that... Yeah. It forces repetitive reading so uh -huh. you can understand uh -huh. it better and deeper. And maybe that's why it, they, those things have survived for 2,000 years, right? Because there's different layers uh, that you can read it at. And this, is, this, this happens with the Bible. A lot of people go, like, they'll come to me and go, I want to read the Bible. And I'm like, okay, wh what do you want to read it for? Like, what's your purpose for reading? Like if you've never read the Bible, I just say read it just so you know names, characters, stuff in the Bible. Yeah. Uh, if you want to read it devotionally, that's a bit different. If you want to read it to study the text, I mean, what are we studying? Poetry, Old Testament, New Testament, all that stuff. And and this is okay. just true of literature. Just, this is not just about the Bible, right? Yeah. If I'm reading the Odyssey or the Iliad or something like that, or if I'm reading the Republic, like what's the purpose I'm reading for? Uh, and then that might, it might be necessary, I guess, that I read it again. And I remember reading a book in Bible college uh, called How to Read a Book by Mortimer Adler. And yeah, and th that book was Good one of book. the books the that changed. Yeah, that, that was one of the books that changed my life. And I was like, oh man, reading is really complicated. It's not just recognizing letters and words. Maybe that's, that's the right. difference between modern education and classical education. It's like one teaches you to recognize letters and put them together and come up with words yeah. and sentences. And the other one is doing something else. That's right. I mean, by, by Adler's definition, most of us are illiterate because we can't unlock the deeper meaning Correct. in the book. We can, we can scan and read out loud all the words on the page without necessarily understanding the connections between the chapters, the connections between that book and other books that it's in explicit dialogue with, you know, Gulliver's travels is, is funny and, and a great story. It's a good one for the kids to read. And it's in dialogue with, like a thousand or 1500 years of European tradition. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like he is, he's playing, he's playing off of making fun of endorsing, denying all this world of stuff. So to really read Gulliver's travels, you can read it and maybe get some of the jokes and laugh, but to really read it, you kind of have to be well read, which is hilarious huh. to think of your entertainment. You know, you're, you're going to get more out of your entertainment if you've read you know, a hundred books off of a great books list. You're really going to enjoy Gulliver's Travels. Like we're talking about peak pleasure here, you know? So, the, so yeah, but, I think but the it's just true of modern entertainment as well. Like, look, I'm a, I'm a big Marvel fan. Okay. Not as big as some people are, yeah. but I really enjoy, uh, enjoy that stuff. It's like, you can't do that without thinking about ancient Greek mythology. Mm -hmm. Right. Like the, uh, I was having a conversation with some friends the other day and we're, we're talking about Thanos and I said, uh, and then I told them that the Greek word for death is Thanatos. And it's like, oh, 
like that's cool man like if you just know yeah. this now you know why Thanos is Thanos and then in the in the comics at least he's in love with death that's yeah. whose attention he's trying to get and death again it takes you back to greek mythology and all this stuff so if you don't have that if you're doing it just for pure pleasure i guess and entertainment a good amount of this stuff is going to go over your head like the way they're dressed dc comics you know if you're looking at wonder woman and uh, you know like the Am the amazons like where is this stuff in real like where is the foundation yeah. for it oh yeah it's in these ancient literatures right it's the rich literatures that we're getting all this stuff from yeah i'd have to fact check it but I i'm assuming that like jack kirby and uh stan lee and these guys were you know they're old enough that their schools may have been closer to what we call classical than than they are to what we now call modern or public education because because they would it would just be a matter of course that they would read virgil you know i hadn't heard the word virgil till i got to college i didn't know what a virgil was <laughs> and um you know and and my professor looked at me and said you don't know who virgil is i said yeah and he said sad you know i'm so sorry for you and i was like what and then it turns out virgil's like the greatest roman poet and he kind of like one of the founders you could say of western civilization mm. in that he conceived of rome pre pre-christian rome he conceived of rome as like god's gift to government and and so on and then that vision of rome which was idealized actually kind of came true when the christians you know took mm. it over and spread it throughout the world and so the the modern world today is formed by the roman vision of the world which was formed by virgil so it's like no one ever explained that to me in high school right but yeah. hopefully with our with our kids we're trying to get them to read virgil in ninth grade and to start talking about the implications for what it means for america for western civilization in ninth grade so that by the time they get to senior year they can read freud nietzsche marx darwin and start to talk about the architects of our modern age and how that's so different from what's come before. So that's uh, two comments here, I guess. Uh, one of the things was I remember being in uh, in graduate school. My bachelor's degree was in biblical studies, um, so I jumped into philosophy head head first. Uh, and yeah, and then I realized that classmates that had bachelor's degrees in philosophy and then had some form of something like a humanities classical education. And, you know, we we're reading like, uh, I took an ethics class, we we're reading Nick and Mickey and ethics. And it was the first time I picked up the book to read it. And then I have classmates who read it in ninth grade and they read it in college. Wow. And then now they're reading it a third time. And I was just like, man, I am at such a disadvantage. <laughs> um, just the, they had parents who said, hey, you got to read this, right? Or they went to schools and were part of systems of education where they were like, you got to read this. And here I am yeah. as a, whatever, 27 year old reading this for the first time. And they're like 24, 25 and it's their first time reading it. Right. I'm oh, sorry. It's their third time. reading yeah. it. And I'm just like, yeah, I, this has to change uh, with, with my kids. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I forgot the second thought. Go ahead. If you have comments. Well, yeah, that, that sort of touches on a, like a personal development point, which is, you know, a lot of my job, like as headmaster and, and even as teacher, is just coaching people in their mindset to mm. say, you can do this. This isn't for smart people and it's not overwhelming. It's really bite-sized chunks. You know, a lot of parents will say, um, I wish I would have had this when I was in high school or whatever. And I have, I have to follow that up with, well, you have it now. Like, don't, don't make any excuses. Like I'm so busy, blah, blah. You can get an audio book of the Nick and McKeon ethics read by this guy on LibriVox for free. Amen. You can set it at 1.25 pace. You can set it at 0.75 pace if you're really struggling. And you could read Nick and McKean Ethics in about, I don't know, 10 hours. Yeah. Like this weekend. This so could be your first time. I, right? I would, I, when I was in Armenia, I was going running. And I listened to like all the Socratic dialogues. Like all of them on audiobook, <laughs> on LibriVox. Like I just, and then I would just take like so really great. detailed notes. Um, and at the same time, um, uh, I was reading a history of philosophy by um, forgetting his name, the nine volume one. Um, Not uh, Thomas Nagel, but um, no, 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 it's sitting right behind me. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Co Copland? No, no, not Copland. Something like that. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a nine volume series on the history of philosophy, probably the best out there. But what I'm saying is that I was reading that, and then you know, it's, it's a history book. So he he mentions things and goes through it, and then you want to say, well, I want to read 
I want to read those actual dialogues. Like I want to read yeah. the Republic or whatever. Like, uh, oh, I want to read the Youth of Roll. And some of these things aren't that long. And just putting them on, there's free audiobooks. LibriVox is a great resource. And just reading it, right? And, and, and yeah. it's, it's manageable, run, it's doable. Especially if you live in LA and you're spending so much time in traffic. Exactly, dude. I mean, if imagine it's, instead of, and I do, I do listen to podcasts. There's a few podcasts I listen to every day. But imagine if you're in your car, let's say five hours a week. Um, imagine you're not doing five hours of radio, five hours of of podcasts, which you know can be can be nourishing, but are often a little bit more ephemeral, not as much meat on the bone. Right. Imagine if you're doing five hours a week of of Virgil or 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 Ulysses Utopia, the original Utopia, which is a, which is a fantastic mm-hmm. book. I just read as an adult, you know, on audio. Imagine you're reading Gulliver's Travels, which I only read as an adult. You know, these are books that I don't consider myself all that educated. I and mean, to your point of like you were reading this stuff for the first time, I have a PhD, but uh, the standards have have lowered. You know, the, uh, C.S. Lewis had an M.A. Is you think I'm more educated than C.S. Lewis? Come on now. Yeah. Um, and so. Uh, and I you know, probably knew uh, like three languages, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he knew a tons of languages. A, a lot of these you guys know, know like Latin, like, Greek, like Latin, Greek, and then like their their own native language, and uh, that is just not a part of our our educational system. And that's it was. right. That's right. I, so I, I consider us all to be playing catch up, and I think that's just a mindset switch to say, um, as standards have dropped over generations, then yes, of course we're all behind kind of what we could have been blah, blah, blah. But it's not so much about griping about it as, as an adult, now you have responsibility for your own life. Take responsibility for educating yourself and re-educating yourself. Doesn't necessarily mean go back to school, which I did as an adult, but it might mean uh, channeling your interests towards something that's a little bit of a stretch, right? JP Moreland said something uh, to me one time that really made an impact on me. And he said, I'm always reading at least one book that's too hard for me. Yes. And I'm going, dude, you're, you're JP Moreland. Like, what does that mean <laughs> too hard for you? You've read everything, right? And he says, no, I, I have to struggle. I have to reread. I have to read commentaries. I have to take notes. I have to go teach it to try to like explain it to somebody else so that I can see whether I actually understood mm-hmm. it. And I was like, okay, if this guy who's, you know, at that time he was in his 50s, if this guy is a fully formed, you know, powerhouse of an intellect, is always stretching himself, that that tells me that I can do that. Even if it's um, reading something that is not, quote unquote, excessively hard, like Gulliver's Travels. Gulliver's Travels is a challenging book to read. It's highly entertaining, but it might be a little bit of a stretch, right? So that's a great choice for you if, if you're not much of a reader or if you are a reader, but you only read kind of contemporary novels. Just pick a novel that's highly entertaining from the past and struggle through it. Keep a dictionary on hand, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I suppose uh, one of the other things you can do if you have children and you're interested in this, and, and people kind of make a whole mess of like homeschooling and stuff like that, uh, is that yeah. you can you can go back and do that stuff with your kids. Your kids don't have to know this, right? So I'll give you an example. Um, I, I was not brought up in a home where I even knew the, C- the name C.S. Lewis, by the way. I was introduced to that within like Christian context and stuff like that. Um, and so I've never read the Chronicles of Narnia. So one of the things I've been doing with my kids is reading the Chronicles of Narnia with them, right? Like I, I read it to them and then nice. we'll go through it. My, my son, like I was reading it to them and it was too slow for him. And so he, he was just yeah. like, he was like, okay, dad, like. I don't know. He's probably finished the sixth one right now, and um, he he wanted more of it. And so he, he he's a. I'm happy he's a reader, but um, with other kids, you could still do that. And that's just an opportunity for me to say, hey, here's a book I've never read, right? Yeah. Let me sit down and and read this with them, or listen to it with them, or something like that. That's perfect. Yeah. One of the things that we've tried to do um, imperfectly is create a. A shelf that's that's kind of like the free free reading shelf that's the menu for my son huh. and we, we we loaded it early on when he was like two we loaded it with some of our favorite books from when we were kids and so those are like known quantities but now as we add things to it it's usually books that you know his friends are reading and we haven't read and so and the parents are like no no it's good it's good and so we'll read it out loud and we'll add it to our personal you know, library, like, oh, now we've, we've enjoyed this book. We've enjoyed this media. So it's, it's entertaining for us too. I mean, I'm not above reading uh, green ember about like the rabbits or wing feather, which is also kind of a, a really funny, you know, playful 
Um, I'm not above enjoying these for my own, you know, part of my own reading diet. And it's something to connect with the kids. And it's, it's kind of exposure to new things. So you can go with a classic. You can go with uh, you know, some of our childhood books were like Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew and that kind of stuff, which isn't classical literature by any means. But I have nostalgia for it. So we'll throw some things in there. And then I'm also planting it with like Treasure Island, right? Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm seeding it with G.K. Chesterton's short stories, which are a little gruesome. You know, I, I, I told my son, I said, I said, these are a little bit scary and there's kind of some blood and there's some murder and stuff like that. So you may not want to read them. And he's like, oh, okay, okay. So, <laughs> obviously, I'm advertising. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm seeding it with some, some bombshells that I think will, if they read it, they're going to have this, like, huge reaction um, and at the same time, I'm, I'm doing the same thing. I'm educating myself with the books that I read to them or we read together. So it's a great strategy. So uh, as, as we're going we're gonna to finish up soon, um, would you say uh, kind of the thing that gives classical education its um, umph, <laughs> right, uh, is the fact that as you're getting education, there's a focus of character development and maturity that's included in there, as opposed to mm-hmm. modern or, or, or progressive education, where it's kind of like, here's a bunch of information, um, or maybe even here's a bunch of edu- here's a bunch of information, and then there's a moral, because you and I are Christians and we hold to high moral standards and stuff like that, and a certain kind of sexual ethics, where there's a even a perversion of it or a degradation of it or something like that yeah yeah i think i think that's essentially um a good way to think about it is you know we don't use the word character as much i mean the greek word for character is probably ethos right we talk about virtue and that's that's the, um that's what makes virtue becoming virtuous is what makes life meaningful only virtuous people um are basically are accurate judges of whether or not they're enjoying life like plato says you can even be deceived about how much pleasure you have you know you might think you're living a pleasurable life and you're not you're actually failing your life your life is like a two percent on the pleasure meter um but because it's fast easy to love pleasures it feels like enough for you and meanwhile you wonder why you're depressed and empty Hmm. um and and so what we're going for is we're going for the the rich uh, flourishing enjoyment life, which thankfully and, and scarily depends on us. It depends on our own choices, our own virtues, whether we are trying to fight the temptations of, of this life. And you can read Aristotle, and he'll sound, you know, quite quite a lot like a Christian. Um, or you can read a church father, who's going to say the same thing, which is um, the pleasures of this life are the number one cause of people ruining their their mm. their character and becoming and becoming a vice ridden you know human being so if you if you take responsibility for that at a young age if you have a culture around you of your family and friends and, and hopefully society but even if not society if you live among the philistines um if you take responsibility for your own virtues and you push in that direction then uh you know you can build your your own happiness around you, even in the midst of a world that's that's going to pot. So I think it's very powerful, and I think that it's a great gift to receive. It's a great gift to pass on. Yeah. So. so yeah, it's not a surprise that a bunch of uh, Christians, like oh, okay, the two that come to my mind, uh, you know, Augustine and Aquinas, would be that they get so closely associated with Plato and Aristotle, um, and yeah. predominantly it's because they were just saying true stuff. I mean, they don't agree with everything these guys say. But those things that are they're saying that are true, these guys affirm it, um, maybe explain it a bit differently and more in depth, I, I would say, theologically. But it's there, right? And, and it's not only that we've gotten rid of, or we're getting rid of, maybe you could say, our Christian kind of heritage, Western Christian heritage, but we're even getting rid of like non-Christian heritage as well. Uh, and yeah. then and then we sit there and kind of wonder what's going on, like how are we going to make sense of the world and how are going to we're we going to teach kids that they have intrinsic virtue, uh, in, intrinsic value and importance and existence. I mean, these things, it's it's it, there's a foundation. And once we get rid of the foundation, that becomes a problem. And it seems to me that classical education and what, what you're doing is reintroducing young people or introducing young people and reintroducing their parents 
uh, yeah. to to the foundations of, of our society and culture. That's right. Yeah, you, you don't want to throw it away uh, simply because it appears to violate some you know ethical norm that has been in vogue for five minutes. Um, we, we want to be very careful about which uh, pieces of the foundation, to use your image, which pieces of the foundation may need to be repaired or replaced. Um, you know, repairing a foundation means shoring up the whole house hmm. in the meantime. So there's, it's a very careful, delicate surgical process. And probably we should actually look, examine some of these quote unquote standards, um, you know, inequalities, racism, sexism. Mm. We should, you know, ask our progressive friends to, to sort of like think harder about whether those standards are really helpful in any way. Um, the cost, even if they were helpful, the cost of making the change is extraordinarily high. Mm. And if they aren't helpful, then of course the, the, making that change is a complete mistake. It's a waste of energy and it's wrong. So, we really need to kind of fight that battle um, in society and in the universities and so on. But more so, we need to focus on, you know, in ourselves, um, what, am I, what are my ideals? What am I pursuing? How can I uh, in influence my family? And who am I hanging out with? Can we band together? I mean, this is kind of a, a morbid image here, but if you were in a uh, hospital and a lot of people wandering around who don't realize they're sick and aren't taking the medicine, you would try to help them, but at the end of the day, it's really about you taking your medicine, and around you, those people are going to die off, and who's going to be left? It's the ones who took the medicine. Mm. I'm not wishing death upon anybody. I'm saying an analogy here that that the cultural and social beliefs that are going to result in those people's kind of destruction, they aren't having children, they aren't transmitting their beliefs to their children, they aren't passing on their heritage, all of those people are going to like die out either culturally or physically. And those of us who believe in the tradition that we've received are going to be the ones passing it on to our kids. Mm. And so we kind of just have to, we kind of just have to stay the course, you know? Yeah. Uh, that's a good, uh, a good note to end on, man. I mean, that, that's, that's wise right there. Right. So it, it tells us that Christians ought to have kids, which you're doing. Uh, <laughs> you got, you got four there. Uh, I got three. That's pretty good, man. The good numbers right there. Yeah. Um, and, and that we, we, we teach them we we are responsible to teach them and guide them and raise them properly um and if the culture next to us it wants to burn itself which is not what we want we want repentance and we want uh back we, essentially we want like a renaissance of sorts um that's right then uh then people will join us and and, and for that and you're working with a young, bunch of young people to do that and who are doing that so in in some, sometimes we look at the large picture and we kind of get depressed about it. And then whenever I talk to people like you and, and, and the pockets and I see people doing sorts of things like this and I go, there's hope, man. There's hope because there's God hope. is good. Yeah, right. uh, God hasn't abandoned us, right? Like God hasn't abandoned the world. Uh, the gospel goes forth and people come to know him. And, um, and, and God will not abandon us. And, and I will say, yeah, that I mean, the, the the goal, the hope for everybody is that they they take their medicine too, and that um, that even though I'm an educator and I'm a full time, you know, headmaster and a parent, like I would say that the majority of my attention is still focused on my own growth. Like it's still knowing my inadequacies. It's yeah. trying to learn more. It's trying to read more. It's trying to. I mean, I have so many vices and bad habits that I'm trying to reform. And that, yes, that's a good example, you know, hopefully for my kids and my students, but, you know, ultimately I'm responsible for myself and, and I, I, I try to give to my community out of whatever God is giving to me. Um, and so it really is just a whole mindset of everyone has to take care of themselves. Paul says, bear, you know, everyone bears his own burden, burden in Galatians in the same chapter that he says, bear each other's burdens, right? I have to kind of, I have to look out for you and your your friends and your family and your school and you have to do the same for me but also you have to take care of you and i have to take care of me and if we take that if we take that mindset um as parents as educators we're going to continue to grow whether or not the culture ever comes to its senses and takes its own medicine yeah well keith i want to thank you man thank you for jumping in here and and on the run and in the middle of things and stopping by at a at, at a mcdonald's uh, to have this conversation, so I really appreciate it because I know you have uh, you're packed busy and you're gonna be traveling soon and stuff like that. So uh, God is with you uh, and will accompany you. I hope you get good rest and 
uh, and enjoy your family and time with your family, brother. Um, Thank so you, man. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's do it again. I'm sure that we uh, barely scratch on the surface, but I really appreciate you having me on and pushing through some of the technical difficulties. It was fun. Yeah. Thank you, man. Uh, well, everybody, I want to thank you guys for jumping in here and, and, and watching this. If you're watching the replay, as I always say, you are a trooper because it's always difficult to watch replays of this stuff. Uh, maybe you have it in the background and just go in. Uh, thank you for that. Appreciate it. App appreciate the support. If you're on here and uh, you haven't subscribed and like, go ahead and subscribe and like and, and share the other videos out. Thank you, guys. God bless you. We will see you next time.